Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the first of four webinars in our series on smart solar siting for New England, uh, where the, the folks you have in front of you, American Farmland Trust, Conservation Law Foundation, Vote Solar, Acadia Center, and the Vermont Law School, um, we're going to take the next four webinars to share what we've learned over the last two years when we've been seeking to find ways to reduce conflicts over the siting of solar projects in New England. I want to take a moment right off the bat and, and thank the organizations who have funded and supported this work, the John Merck Foundation, the Barr Foundation, and the National Agricultural Library. And before we get started on our webinar content, a few uh, housekeeping items and logistical things. Uh, first, you have all been muted, so no need to do that yourself. We do have um, quite a few attendees today. We would like to ask that if you have a question or a comment, you do so by going to the control panel that's on the right-hand side of your screen. There's an orange arrow at the top of that panel that allows it to shrink and reopen. Once it's open, you should see a question section of that control panel and you can pop right in there. Um, you can actually pop it out as a separate square if you like, and then that can <clears throat> decouple it from the screen so that you can type and ask your questions. Uh, we will have uh, a good portion of time at the end of this for discussion and Q&A, where we will pose those questions to the panelists that you see here today. We are recording this webinar and we will make it available online along with the other resources from this project. And we'll send the link of this recording to everyone who has registered. And please feel free to share this recording with others. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Emily Cole. I am the Climate and Agriculture Program Manager for American Farmland Trust here in New England. Um, and those of you who may not be familiar with American Farmland Trust, we're a national nonprofit founded in 1980 and we believe that saving the land that sustains us means focusing not just on retaining and protecting agricultural land, but on the management of that land and on the farmers, ranchers, and landowners who work that land. Um, we work from the kitchen tables of, and to the halls of Congress, and uh, we work from direct land protection to soil health, water quality initiatives, all the way to training service providers and helping the next generation of farmers. Um, our, our policy programming and research informs state and federal policy development and advocacy. We do have six regional offices and uh, I am based out of our New England one, which is in Northampton, Mass. A little bit on the, the uh, series overview. Next one, please, Beth. Um, we have been working as a partnership uh, for almost two years now, trying to develop consensus-based solutions-oriented approaches to the big problem that we know if left unaddressed, we will not only lose farmland, but we will also miss our climate goals. Um, we've been working to do quite a few things together and we are excited to present what we found today with you. Next, please. Uh, today, we are going to really give you a lay of the policy landscape. We are going to um, address regional differences between policies and programs. And then we are also going to look through some of the higher level uh, guidelines and process principles that we think um, are key to a, a good energy program development. Uh, next week, we hope you join us for our focus on balancing land conservation with smart solar siting. That will be led by Phelps Turner from CLF and Deborah Donovan from Acadia Center. And with our guests next week will be Eliza Donahue from Maine Audubon, Ellen Griswold from Maine Farmland Trust and David Sutherland, Sutherland from the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. So we hope that we will also see you next week. Next, please. And so with that, I'd like to give the rest of our key project partners an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves if, if you want to start, Genevieve. Hi, my name is Genevieve Byrne. I'm a staff attorney and assistant professor at Vermont Law School's Institute for Energy and the Environment. And I work under our Farm and Energy Initiative, um, which looks at, at issues at the intersection of energy and agriculture and is funded by the National Agriculture Library. Go ahead, Deb. Hi, I'm Deborah Donovan of, of Acadia Center. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Acadia Center, our mission is to advance bold, effective, and equitable clean energy solutions. Uh, so that we can have a livable climate and a more strong and equitable economy. We work on this transition um, through uh, public engagement um, across the Northeast, 
Um, we work in coalition and develop um, advocacy positions and analysis um, on a whole wide range of clean energy topics. Um, we really want to emphasize that um, our response to the environmental and economic crisis of climate change needs solutions that are proportional to that um, crisis, um, but that in particular, um, the resources that we begin to rely on and rapidly deploy need to be um, cited in an appropriate way. Um, and that by doing so, we can advance the really compelling actions that our region, our states, and our, our localities need to take. I'm the director of advocacy for Massachusetts. We, we have um, advocacy programs um, in every state in New England. Um, I work with regulators, legislators, and a broad coalition of advocates on, on a range of clean energy policies. I'm also the lead for our clean energy, uh, clean power initiative, and their uh, Acadia Center is working on how to advance large scale and distributed renewable resources. And um, in, in particular, trying to align wholesale power markets and distributed utilities so that we can achieve our clean energy goals. I've worked on siting issues in the past as well. Um, I was a consultant with Sustainable Energy Advantage where I co-directed the Northeast Wind Resource Center, which was funded by NREL and worked with NYSERDA to update their um, wind siting resource guide. Thanks. Go ahead, Sean. Hey there, Sean Guerin. I am the Senior Director for the Northeast at Vote Solar. Uh, Boat Solar is a nationwide advocacy group working to bring solar into the mainstream and make sure it's accessible and affordable for everybody. So we work on state level policy and regulation all across the country. And as a nonprofit dedicated to solar one technology, um, but you know, coming from an environmental and climate change driven mission, uh, we've long worked across the various different pro-solar voices and communities, uh, environmental groups, solar industry, other clean energy industries, consumer advocates, you name it, and really excited uh, to have been part of this partnership and be discussing this because this is definitely a place where a lot of different interests are coming together and there's a serious need for bridging the divide between those communities and figuring out a smart path forward that continues to provide access to solar for everybody in a in a really intentional way and maintains land conservation, strong agricultural industries, you name it. Thanks, Sean. Go ahead, Phelps. Good afternoon, Phelps Turner. I'm a senior attorney at Conservation Law Foundation. I work out of our office in Maine. CLF, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, is a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. We have offices in Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Through our farm and food initiative, uh, CLF works to shape and foster a sustainable regional food system to help increase fresh food access, create jobs, foster healthy communities, and support regional economies. Through our clean energy climate change program, CLF works to equitably decarbonize our entire economy, advocating for policies and projects that boost low cost, locally made clean energy, including solar energy, saves families money and creates jobs. And we're a proud uh, partner um, with our fellow organizations. Thanks. Thanks. And last, I would like to uh, welcome our guest today, who is going to bring a, an added perspective that we don't have in this partnership to our discussion later on. So uh, Lucy, please take a moment to introduce yourself. I'm Lucy Bullock Seeger from Blue Wave Solar, um, Director of Civic Engagement. And thanks for having me today. I'm we're so excited about this effort, and it's really going to add a, a much needed um, dynamic to the siting um, conversation in the Northeast and beyond as well, because there are other markets that are just getting into community solar and having these same questions. So it's going to be really great to have this guidance um, for them as well. Um, Blue Wave is a community and public um, solar developer and community solar servicer. We've developed almost 100, uh, 200, nearly 200 uh, megawatts of community solar projects in New England um, and the, the Northeast. And 
we have been really focused on um, since the beginning being a really good partner to um, landowners, but particularly farmers. We've found that um, it's a really important um, viability conversation to have with them. And um, also being good stewards of the land is something that we really take pride in. And we have been having conversations with our colleagues and led by Sean Guerin um, and Vol Solar about how do we um, restart the siting conversation in Massachusetts, um, particularly, but informing um, the other states conversations as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to walking through this with you and looking forward to the questions at the end. Thank you, Lucy. We're happy to have you here today. Um, behind the scenes is our technical support, Beth Frazier, uh, my colleague at American Farmland Trust. She's the wizard behind the curtain. So if you could actually launch our first poll, Beth, that would be great. So um, we're excited to have uh, over 100 of you here today, and we would like to know what you are most interested in getting out of this webinar series, if you could take a moment um, and choose your, your most wanted result or most wanted takeaway. And while you are doing that, I'd like to welcome uh, colleagues and partners from across the nation. Um, we have all of the New England states, we have several mid-Atlantic states, and we have all three of the West Coast states uh, <laughs> registered and attending here today. We're really excited to see that. And we have such a wide variety of um, stakeholders here. We have farmers and landowners, we have land trust staff, we have municipal staff and volunteers, we have um, quite a number of nonprofit staff members, regional planners, um, we have the solar industry, and we have um, quite a few state agency representatives, everything from uh, Connecticut Deep. Uh, MDAR, we have uh, Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources, we've got Vermont National Resources, New Hampshire Conservation Districts, Maine DACF, and more. Um, thank you to all of you and welcome. We're glad to have you here today. So, <laughs> Looks like we do have quite a few that are most interested in understanding the land conservation and solar compatibility issue. Um, I think that is something that we all hoped to understand more when we got started with this project and we hope that we will be able to share that with you. We also see quite a few of you interested in hearing from a diverse set of perspectives, um, which is partly what brought us together in this partnership um, from different sectors and we hope to bring in even more diverse um, opinions, perspectives through the course of this webinar series. So thanks again for everyone to be here. I am going to now um, hand this off to our two uh, webinar leaders today, uh, Deborah Donovan and Ge uh, Genevieve Byrne, who are going to start us off. Thanks so much. Okay, now that I'm unmuted, um, I will kick things off. And um, if you could advance to the next slide, oh, thank you. So um, again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us and thank you to the, um, the, the funders for this project. It's, it's really been a pleasure to work on this. Um, I'm gonna briefly kick off um, the subject matter um, in the context of what we're facing globally as a nation and as a region with um, respect to the climate crisis um, I was on the CNN website yesterday and saw this graphic and, and I just wanted to um, put this out as a, as a starting point because um, there is a lot to do um, across the globe, but also there's a lot to do here in the Northeast um, and across the country um, so that we could have a shot of meeting either the um, two degrees Celsius or the 1.5 degrees Celsius target um, for a livable planet, um, but also showing how, how far we are off, both of the targets that have been committed to so far, but also what our actual emissions are right now. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these targets are um, driven by the IPCC um, report that is recommending, or at the time it came out, um, achieving a net zero carbon economy um, by 2050 or sooner. And in order to get there, that's going to require um, having a 50% reduction from 1990 levels by, by 2030. 
Um, I, I do want to point out that um, there's, you know, everybody is seeing um, the reports of, of um, fires, widespread fires, extreme heat, drought, a number of hurricanes that exceed the letters in the alphabet, ocean warming and ice melt um, in our key areas of the globe um, just in the last two or three months. And that, that really is indicating that things that we were trying to prevent, you know, 15 or 20 years from now, um, many of those are happening today. Um, in addition, the, um, the COVID pandemic has exposed um, in, in very high relief um, how disproportionately impacted um, environmental justice communities are by both air pollution and climate change, and that this um, needs to be woven into our going forward um, design of our uh, climate response. So I'm gonna just um, go on to the next slide. Um, what, um, what we want to talk about here is is how to make the next decade count. And so we're by rapidly accelerating um, the deployment of clean energy generation uh, using technologies that we do have available now um, and combining that with a full electrification of our buildings and transportation and supported by aggressive um, expansion of energy efficiency. Um, we can devote ourselves to making as much progress over the next 10 years as we can. Um, the other component of this that's really an essential part of making this work and is very key for solar um, is having a grid that's operated, um, you know, we're calling it the grid modernization or the, or the um, utility innovation model um, that's centered on consumers and climate goals um, that's just and equitable and that relies on things like distributed energy resources like solar um, to have, be a resilient and a responsive grid. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide just um, indicates, and this is um, coming from an Acadia Center analysis called Energy Vision 2030, which was published three years ago. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't tie my um, future plans to the numbers that are in here because we have advanced um, our ambitions and the need for achieving those. Uh, but this just shows you how, in combination, the electrification of the um, transportation and um, building sectors combined with a decarbonized grid uh, can um, go a long way toward achieving our goals in 2030 and, and 2050. Next slide, please. So solar's role in this path to decarbonizing electricity, one of the essential ingredients to achieving our goals, um, it is just one of the more essential arrows in our, our quiver. It's a, a te technology that's available today. Um, it has many benefits that, that we're all well aware of. Um, and in particular, um, what I hadn't mentioned before was how well solar pairs naturally with storage and responsive demand. Um, and those are ingredient, ingredients to a, um, a, a modernized grid. We have a challenge of bridging the gap between um, those that have benefited from uh, solar deployment so far and um, many low and moderate income households that you know have yet to find a way to participate and benefit from solar deployment. So what do we need by 2030? Um, one of the things that came out of our energy vision analysis was an accelerated scenario, which matches roughly to the IPCC 50% by 2030 target. And from there, um, we determined that um, in combination with um, other strategies and technologies that New England would need 20 gigawatts of solar by, by 2030. Um, and I will say before we go on to the next slide that um, our, our independent system operator, the RTO um, here, the regional transmission organization that manages our wholesale grid, our regional wholesale grid that covers all six New England states, uh, is currently working off of a forecast for 2030 of eight gigawatts. They're basing that simply on um, what is on the books right now of the six New England states for their policies and heavily discounting all of those state ambitious targets um, that exist. Uh, so they're, the, what 
what I'm bringing this up for is because I just want to make a make a point that um, that not only do we have to plan for how we're going to use the land or the sites that uh, the solar is going to be sited on, but we do have to make a plan for how to look ahead from the next 10 years of how is how are we going to support all of these gigawatts on our grid and we're working very hard to get the grid operator to actually plan for what we need and not discount it in a significant way. Uh, next slide, please. This table illustrates how um, the renewable um, electric generation would contribute to achieving a 50% reduction in combination with electrification and energy efficiency. So enough said on that, but I do encourage you to go to Acadia Center's website um, or Google Energy Vision 2030, and we have a whole dedicated website that um, presents that data. Um, and uh, for my last slide, if we can advance to that. Um, and the uh, second webinar of this series, um, I'll be presenting uh, some analysis, some top-down analysis that Acadia Center did about um, a, a alternative um, sites um, and the potential for those types of sites to serve the region's needs to achieve the, the 20 gigawatt target. Um, so uh, just to preview for you here, um, we took the 20 gigawatt target and split it out across the states um, by population. And then from there divided it between um, gigawatts that, that could be at, um, deployed under um, the distributed uh, generation versus and um, and the utility scale generation. So um, I encourage you to come next week and hear some more about the analysis um, where we um, provide some estimates of how much um, contaminated sites and residential rooftops could serve the region's needs. And I will hand it back to Genevieve now. Thanks, Deb. Uh, Beth, you can go to the next slide. Um, so we, whoops, my <laughs> computer's gonna fall over. Um, we just heard Deb explain why we want 20 gigawatts of solar in New England to meet the IPCC's 50% reductions by 2030 target. And it's definitely gonna take some work to get there. Um, but we wanted to acknowledge that we've also made significant progress in solar development, particularly in the last decade. Um, solar has increased significantly across the United States in how much energy it's contributing to the grid, the number of installations and installed capacity, as well as in job creation and economic investment. Um, we now have more than 81 gigawatts of solar capacity installed nationwide, which is enough to power about 15.7 million homes and in terms of jobs, uh, about 250,000 Americans work in solar now, which is more than double the number of people we had back in 2012. Um, in 2019 alone, the solar industry generated about $18.7 billion of investment in the American economy. So it's certainly a growing industry. Uh, next slide. Um, as compared to the United States, New England is also making significant contributions to this solar development, even though we know that New England may not be the sunniest place to live. Um, by the end of 2019, the New England states had installed more than 4.3 gigawatts of solar capacity, uh, with nearly 175,000 separate solar installations contributing electricity to the grid. In 2019 alone, utilities reported um, nearly 550 megawatts of solar growth. So most of the solar arrays in New England are relatively small scale. Um, small scale, as we'll talk about later, has a lot of different definitions, but here I mean just less than about five megawatts. And they are mostly, um, in terms of numbers, installed behind the meter. You can see that Vermont has the highest solar installed per capita uh, or per person in the state, but Massachusetts has um, far and away the most solar 
uh, total capacity installed. And that results both from a combination of policy and investment in solar development. Um, Massachusetts has seen over $7 billion in investment in solar, while as compared to Maine, who has the least, has seen the least amount of solar development, um, they've, they've experienced $221 million in investment. So when you come back for webinar three, we'll be talking a lot more about how policy can accelerate solar development and um, also talking more about the market for solar growth. Uh, next slide. So we know that we need solar energy and we know that the solar industry is already developing rapidly. Um, and the question comes down to where is it going and where should it go? Um, without land use protections built into state permitting and approval processes, rapid solar development is likely to occur on farmland or agricultural land. Um, this land tends to provide easy conditions for solar construction and operation. We've got these nice, flat, sunny, large parcels of land. Um, so then we end up with competition between beneficial land uses, agriculture and solar development. And this competition can delay the siting of our renewable energy resources that we really need. And it can also threaten far farmland and food systems, um, which we also need, especially given our changing climate. So the New England states differ both in total land area, in acreage, and in types of farmland, as well as in rates of land loss and farmland conversion. Um, farmland makes up 7 to 20 percent of total land in each New England state, and Vermont has while not being the biggest state, actually has the highest percentage of farmland. Um, Maine is the state with the sort of total most uh, farmland acres. You can see from this chart that farmland is characterized as either cropland, pasture land, woodland, or other land. And I want you to remember that category of other land because we're going to come back to it uh, again a few slides from now. Um, next slide. So the vast majority of farms in New England are under 99 acres. Vermont has the highest percentage of large farms or those over 1,000 acres. And Massachusetts has the most individual farms or farm businesses. Um, it's interesting to take a look at the price of farmland across New England, especially as compared to the US average. Um, in, in the US average, farmland is about $3,160 an acre. And Vermont's land comes very close to that valuation at $3,630. And in New England, Maine is actually the only state under that land value at $2,410 an acre. Um, Rhode Island sort of sticks out in valuation. It's wildly more expensive at over $15,000 an acre. And if you look at the bottom orange line that lists land loss, Rhode Island has also seen the highest rates of farmland conversion or farmland or converting farmland to other uses. Um, they've experienced 18% farmland conversion between 2012 and 2017. And so we shouldn't think about that high price of Rhode Island farmland as protective of that land, but rather as indicative of the demand for land and the competition for land uses. Um, out of all of the New England, uh, all of the New England states it did experience land loss over the period of 2012 to 2017, um, with Massachusetts and Vermont experiencing the least loss at 5 and 6% respectively. However, um, American Farmland Trust's Farms Under Threat report 
found that 50% of all of the la land that we did lose was land of statewide importance. So it was some of our, our good farmland. Um, next slide. Um, forest land can also be put at risk by rapid solar development. State laws should not just look at farmland, but all kinds of land, in, including forest land um, and other valuable natural resources. And I think that these two charts are particularly interesting because they are nearly the opposite of one another. The states with the most forest land seem to experience the least forest land loss or conversion. Um, you can see that Maine has over 17 million forest land acres, but only saw 0.7% forest land loss between 1997 and 2017. Um, Rhode Island, on the other hand, only has 0.37 million acres after losing nearly 10% of its forest land over that same period of time. Again, that's really showing the development pressure on these land types, particularly in Rhode Island. Um, the overall point here is that good solar policy should consider state land use, land loss, and agricultural and forestry characteristics. And it does not mean that um, solar development on farmland or forest land should be prohibited. We will need some green fields to meet our solar development goals, but we want to make sure that when, when solar can go on a roof or a landfill, we prioritize that. Um, solar can also be protective of farmland when we use it to help reduce a farm's electric bills. Um, that helps to support farm viability, which ultimately protects farmland. So we'd, we'd like to find more ways that solar can actually be part of the solution to land loss uh, rather than contributing to the problem. Um, I also want to note that solar is not the only kind of development putting pressure on farmland or forest land, but it is an area where policy is developing quite rapidly. And so it, there are opportunities here to make change. And if we get start to get this right, um, it may even be a model for helping to balance other types of development. Um, when you come back for webinar two, we'll be talking a lot more about farmland, forest land, and the policies that uh, work to balance land conservation with solar development. Um, next slide. So where do we even begin to talk about solar policy? And I will start at the same place I tell my law students to start as frequently as I can, which is with the definition section. Um, on what land do we incentivize solar or restrict it or prohibit it? How do we define that land? How do we define the solar projects that we are incentivizing or restricting? Um, when we establish legal definitions or regulatory categories for both farmland and solar development, um, it really can improve the clarity and specificity of regulations and also create opportunities um, for treating different types of projects differently. State laws might only might be designed to only apply to certain kinds or categories of farmland or kinds or categories of solar development. And so it's imp important to be both purposeful and clear about the lands and projects that are affected by new rules. So starting with farmland, policymakers can consider incorporating or modifying any of the listed definitions um, that may be appropriate for uh, to either sort of copy, incorporate by reference, or modify for your own purposes. Um, we have a couple of useful federal definitions. The Federal Farmland Protection Policy Act is where we get words like prime farmland, unique farmland, farmland of statewide importance, and farmland of local importance. Um, 
the Farmland Protection Policy Act doesn't have anything to do with state solar siting, but the definitions for farmland are often borrowed for other statutory purposes, including rules for solar development. So it's a good place to start looking and thinking about category, different categories of farmland. Um, another source of federal definitions is the USDA Census of Agriculture. Um, the Census of Agriculture collects data on all farmland and active farms in the United States, and the USDA has developed extensive definitions for different types of farms and farmland that can be helpful in targeting certain types of land, either for solar development restrictions or for potential incentives. Um, this includes that category of other land that I mentioned earlier. They define that as land that is on the farm, but consists of the house lot, the barn lot, ponds, roads, ditches, wasteland, and similar type of land. And so not all of that is going to be suitable for solar development, but any of that land that can be used could be a priority for siting. Um, especially for solar arrays that are going to be serving the farm. You can also look to existing state definitions and should look to existing state definitions of both farmland and agriculture and evaluate how those integrate with solar development policy. Um, state law or agency regulations may already define one or multiple meanings for the words farm, farmer, agriculture, agricultural use. And they do that to serve different purposes in different laws and regulations. It might be based on a list of crops, a list of specific agricultural uses, or the suitability of land for farming, the farm's acreage or income. And so all of those can be borrowed to create different categories of farmland where solar development maybe should or maybe should not occur. Um, we also want to encourage lawmakers to identify, to, uh, to define farmland and agriculture directly within the energy title of state code you can define land types uh, directly within your net metering program or within other rate incentives to create categories that are really going to work within the energy development context. Um, moving on to how we define solar development, we often use words like large scale, small scale, utility scale to describe different projects. But these words don't actually have any uniform definitions at all. It, it all depends who you're talking to and in what context. But clear definitions are actually really useful for drawing boundaries around solar development, again, to treat different kinds of projects differently. So we can use program definitions to incentivize solar arrays that are low impact, that are uncontroversial, that are clearly in the public interest. And we can also use them to ensure more oversight of projects that may lead to a loss of important natural resources or lead to significant community conflict. Um, so rather than thinking of things as solar in terms of small scale or large scale or you, you know, utility or community, I think um, using the concepts of size, location, and design in solar policy is more useful. So there are any number of ways that we could characterize a solar array's size. Size-based restrictions are the most common regulatory strategy used in state solar development laws to either restrict or incentivize solar. Um, Array capacity tends to draw a bright line and give regulators a clear yes or no answer for many development applications um, because the overall size of an array really affects every aspect of project development from land use impacts to interconnection costs to the economic potential of the array itself. 
And the questions of how small or how large a solar array should be is really a matter of policy negotiation um, and up to your specific state or regulator. But you can use a number of you can use a number of different um, ideas to sort of loosely align with the size of any given solar array. The first really being array capacity uh, or just how much power or electricity a solar array is going to generate. That's the, again the most common way that states treat different solar arrays differently. Um, but you can also characterize an array size by looking at an associated electrical load or an on-site electrical load. This is um, when you ask who the off-taker is, who's the user of that electricity, and then require that the solar array is sized to meet the needs of that particular user. Uh, that could be a business, a residence, a farm, um, even a, a community group. This also allows solar arrays to be matched more closely to the needs of the electric grid um, where, when we are citing generation closer to load. Um, you can also think about size in terms of land use footprint or the acreage under the array. Higher capacity arrays are likely to have a larger land use footprint. But that generalization can also be a little bit misleading, especially as to some of our better designed solar projects like ag agrivoltaic or dual-use dual use solar, because the land use footprint of less capacity is actually going to increase when it's designed to accommodate agricultural or other um, uses. And so that's something to keep in mind. Customer type also loosely aligns with the size of a solar array. Um, these definitions or categories would, again, ask who the end user consuming the electricity is and how that end user is classified by the utility and the utility's electric rate structures or customer classes. And using this kind of definition can help align solar development rules with existing utility practices, or they can be used to target a specific group of utility customers. So this can be particularly useful, um, for instance, when a utility is delegated the task of designing and implementing a net metering program, because then the users are again aligned with the way the utility is already treating customers. So after um, we think about size, uh, states generally then move to making rules based on the solar array's location. And these definitions or regulatory categories can be used to steer development either toward or away from different certain lands or to put conditions on projects that are located in sensitive areas. So these locational categories become really important because if we don't incentivize alternative sites for development, then again, green fields, farmland, forest land is really the most attractive place to put solar economically. Um, creating just a regulatory category for roof-mounted solar arrays is very low-hanging fruit for solar policy. We can incentivize and fast track roof or structure mounted arrays, which are generally fairly low impact. Um, beyond that, we have states creating lists of preferred sites for solar development. Um, these policies or categories usually include roofs, carports, canopies, other structures, landfills and brownfields, um, or sites that are actually identified through a specific planning process between the state and municipalities. Um, right now in New England, Massachusetts and Vermont are the states that have the most developed um, preferred siting policy. And in both states, higher rates are offered um, to certain solar projects that are located on the preferred sites list. You're gonna hear more about this um, during our webinar three policy discussion. Just a quick note that states or lawmakers um, 
may want to consider lists of ineligible sites for solar development, but we would tend to favor restricting development versus any flat prohibitions on solar to avoid excluding excluding residents from the benefits of clean energy and having a more flexible policy. Um, so definitions or categories based on design are, tend to be kind of higher level solar policy development. Um, this is when you create a regulatory category or definition um, based on how a new solar array is designed, what it looks like, how it's um, installed. And you can, create, you can think about voluntary standards, mandatory standards, or, site, or requiring a site-specific analysis for any specific solar array. Um, one example of this is Vermont's uh, voluntary pollinator habitat standard, where if a solar array meets the requirements for good pollinator habitat, then they get stamped as pollinator friendly, uh, pollinator friendly solar. We also want to encourage you to define agricultural or dual use solar um, in a category that that either in allows or incentivizes or requires a solar array on farmland to exist alongside other agricultural uses so that the land is used for both energy and farming concurrently. Uh, next slide. So solar siting policies are not found in any one state law, but include a very wide assortment of state and local requirements and with uh, often um, authority over any particular solar array is split between a state siting council and local authorities through planning and zoning boards. Um, you can see that this varies quite widely from state to state in New England. For instance, Vermont has preempted all local approvals for all solar arrays, though there are opportunities for municipalities to participate in energy planning and to recommend preferred sites for development. And states really differ on what they consider big enough to go to a state board. In Connecticut, that line is drawn at one megawatt, while in New Hampshire, the line is drawn at 30 megawatts. Um, these different frameworks can present big challenges for solar developers working across the region because a one megawatt array could be going through a trial-like hearing in front of a state siting council, or it could be subject to rules that change depending on what town the array is proposed in. Um, so we have consistency issues when the criteria and the requirements for approval differ for the same project across states or even within towns in the same state. This um, can also mean that in terms of policy advocacy or, or changing solar setting rules, you really may need a sort of multi-pronged approach to policy advocacy. You may need to participate in state legislative actions, in agency rulemakings, or in developing local ordinances and model laws, all depending on where you are and who has authority over solar siting. Um, next slide. So I said that solar policies are not found in any one state law, and as it turns out, the siting decision maker from the last slide is not the only entity making rules about where solar is gonna go. A whole host of other laws are also affecting that decision, either in coordination with the siting authority or behind the scenes. Um, and we're gonna talk about all of these policies a lot more over the course of our next three webinars, but I just wanna touch on them briefly. Um, First, solar is a type of land use, so traditional land use development and environmental regulations are going to apply to new solar installations. That's things like wetlands, endangered species, stormwater runoff, um, anything that your DEP or Agency of Natural Resources does. Um, second, 
climate clean energy goals. Many states are implementing their own goals and mandates regarding climate change. Um, and the, generally, these are accelerating solar development across the region. But land use restrictions and siting incentives can also be built into some of these goals to help protect farmland and agricultural and other uses. Um, our compensation mechanisms for solar, this includes things like net metering programs, feed-in tariffs, other per kilowatt hour incentives. These all may have siting requirements layered into them, particularly if you're in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and they may offer sp special rates for smaller arrays, for those located on preferred sites, or for agrivoltaic arrays that are designed to work with agriculture, depending on the policy. Um, interconnection standards, again, may uh, promote certain sizes or sites for solar arrays. Um, this is the process of connecting a new solar array to the grid, and these rules can be incredibly costly and complicated when particularly when upgrades are needed um, to, upgrades are needed to the grid to install a new solar array. And finally, the tax, tax departments may very well be involved in solar siting. A lot of our land is enrolled in current use taxation programs that allow land to be taxed at their land use value instead of their market value. Um, and uh, these program, programs may simply bar bar land that is enrolled from um, installing solar at all. A lot of states are looking to change these policies to start allowing um, solar development on enrolled land. In terms of other taxes, we also use tax credits or abatements to sales tax or personal property tax, which may certainly affect siting depending on where those, um, where your array is going. So. Just to come full circle, all of the laws on these lists um, identify or define regulated solar projects or land types that they apply to. So as we think about how we regulate solar development, we always have to ask what projects and lands are being included and what projects or lands are being left out of certain regulations. And as solar policy continues to develop, we also need to ask what stakeholders are being included in these in decision making and in these policy conversations, and what stakeholders are being left out. And I will turn things back over to Deb to explore that question a little bit more. Thank you. So uh, one of the things that um, you'll see in your handouts today is a principles and process document uh, that's been developed by our team. And um, what that is, um, is to be um, to support those discussions and conversations around setting the kind of solar siting policies that Genevieve has described. And if you could go on to the next slide. Uh, so, um, based on what we've heard for the last um, uh, several minutes, um, there's a lot of complicated issues and decisions um, that need to be made that can um, dramatically influence how solar siting actually gets done. So, it's um, this is a, just a very quick preview uh, of our. Um, our principles and process document, um, and we'll be uh, switching to um, the Q and A process in a bit. So please keep your questions coming. Um, so the the importance of having um, stakeholder engagement and um, you know aiming for consensus is is a, a really important part of developing policies um, and making sure that all the stakeholders that are um, going to be part of that discussion um, are convened early and that have an opportunity to share their views and contribute to establishing high-level principles um, that could be expressed in a policy statement um, but that it's also essential that folks are working off of the same base of knowledge 
um, what the underlying policies are in all the different sectors that, that Genevieve just described, um, that there's a common set of data that um, all the stakeholders are um, will accept um, as the, the basis and will be relied on. Um, and that the the range of policy choices can be can be fully explored. That there's a commitment to that up front. Um, next slide, please. So, some of the substantive principles that um, could go into these discussions. Um, these are just some suggestions to to start from um, as a way to get conversation going. Um, that you know the the underlying necessity to meet our climate change goals and our state energy goals is um, uh, something that you know will hopefully be broadly accepted and, and included in the in the principles in the stakeholder um, conversation. Um, that the goal is also to make sure that the planning process um, is done in a smart way and that it's you know sort of smart from the start type type of design um, that in particular uh, local decision makers and electeds um, have an opportunity um, to get educated. These are people who are um, probably doing this on a volunteer basis in a lot of cases. They're not professionals, they're not engineers, they're not planners, but um, in order for these conversations to, to include their constituencies and the communities they represent um, that, you know, taking the time to um, develop a, sh a shared set of um, materials, for example, to use as an education process. Um, that, you know, there's a, a good faith effort to define what shared benefits are and to put those at the top of the list. Um, and that, you know, doing these kind of things can um, make sure that uh, different parts of our communities are, are engaged and empowered. Um, to be part of the conversation. Um, and that, you know, that's also going to be against a backdrop of um, what everybody is dealing with outside of this discussion in, in their lives, their professional lives and their personal lives and as homeowners, uh, for example, or business owners. Um, so that needs to be very sensitively um, understood. Um, but it does provide a, an opportunity to, to promote equity and to just be explicit about the intention that that is one of the principles that's that's part of a um, a, a substantive stakeholder engagement process, um, and then getting into the specifics of land use um, to to have take the opportunity and take the time to really lay out what the different possible important priority land uses are, um, you know, in a jurisdiction, and. Um, create a set of shared principles around, um, you know, preferred sites, protecting vulnerable habitat, and um, and making use of what else is out there um, about, you know, innovative policy design and alternative siting methods um, and what those are available. So again, I hope you um, will access the the handout for today and um, make use of this um, in your in your process. And I'm gonna. Um, Flip it back to Emily for a moment um, because we do have a second poll for our audience today. Uh, thank you to both Genevieve and, and Deborah uh, for all of that. <laughs> very useful and also very in depth. This is quite a lot of information to try to cover, and we know that. So we hope that you will join us for two, three, and four over the next weeks to dive into some of these in, in more detail. Um, but before we start Q&A, and so give our, all of our panelists a moment to, to get ready, I would like to pose uh, one more poll to you, Beth, if you would like to launch that. Um, what do you perceive as uh, solar's biggest sighting barriers or challenges? And you have to pick just one. Um, so is it the cost is too high for preferred sites, incentives aren't enough? Is there NIMBYism or community resistance, complicated and confusing oversight processes? Is there lack of expertise uh, of permitting and oversight authorities? Um, or is it that solar developers are not considering conservation and ag? So um, there are other challenges, of course, but of these, let us know what you think is your, um, the, what you think is the biggest barrier for solar. Okay. 
As you finish that, don't forget if you have remaining questions to go over to the, the question box in the right hand side of your control panel and enter those in and we will um, squeeze in as many of those as we can during our Q&A session, which will be the, the remaining half an hour of this webinar. Emily, this is Deborah. While we are waiting for our participants to um, answer the quick poll, um, I wanted to just note that one of our um, one of our questions that's come in already um, is um, about what kind of resources there are out there um, that can help municipalities with this complicated issue. So maybe when we come back to um, our presentation, we could. Um, just show that slide, I believe it's slide 25, um, to answer that question right out of the gate. Well, that would be great. So as that wraps up, uh, what we see here is the cost of preferred sites are too high, incentives don't cover, gets almost equal weight with NIMBYism and, and community resistance, and then that there's not enough consideration of conservation and agriculture by solar developers. Um, and then complicating, confusing oversight and perhaps lack of experience or lack of capacity, um, perhaps at permitting and oversight authorities. Um, so quite a, a broad, well-distributed range there of challenges and we know that there are more. Uh, so Beth, that's actually great. If you could go to slide 25 for a, a moment and then we can go back to the Q&A um, slide. So there are um, several resources that we've put together, a clearinghouse of information in the Farmland Information Center's website, that is a second resource. Um, our project has a page on, on farmland.org. And also, um, if you check out the Vermont Law School's Farm and Energy Initiative Farmland Solar Policy Toolkit, there's quite a lot of resources in there. Um, and that last resource is if you want to dig more into uh, the Energy Vision 2030, that's the Acadia Center site. So we hope that those are, are great starting places for, for resources, not just for municipalities, but for everyone. Um, and then, you know, from there, hopefully it can guide you down the road to more information as well as our remaining three webinars. So if we could go back to the, the Q&A slide. Um, so again, keep uh, asking your questions in the Q&A, and I'm going to hand this off to uh, Deb to, to moderate. Unmuting again. Um, I'll apologize in advance for um, put the potential that I might need to turn my camera off to let my dog out, <laughs> but I'll uh, try to do it when someone's answering a really interesting question. Um, so I'd like to start off <laughs> with um, a question for Sean. Um, I was wondering, Sean, if you might say a bit more about what the opportunities um, there are to address environmental justice as we move forward with um, deploying a, um, a robust solar um, resource. And specifically, do you have any thoughts that you could share about what the best way is to connect our need for more solar energy, you know, our goals for protecting forests and farms, and, and how important it is to advance equity outcomes and, and sharing the benefits um, with marginalized communities in this context? Absolutely. Um, thank you. It's a great question, and I certainly can't say I have all the answers, but I think it's a critical one for us to um, address up front and then, you know, probably constantly throughout. I think the first thing to acknowledge is just that our energy system, along with a lot of systems in America, are built on a long history of racism, classism, xenophobia, a lot of our greatest vices as a nation. And a lot of those um, injustices that have been baked into our system and our economy and our communities uh, play out in solar and they play out in siting, they play out in farmland as well. Um, but solar is and has become the booming industry it is because it's a disruptive technology. Um, it's gotten to the place it is now because it's clean in a mix of fuels that are often dirty and destructive, uh, because it gives customers a choice when electric utilities don't usually give them a choice. Um, it's really disrupted our energy system and become the booming space it is because of that. 
And I think it has an opportunity to disrupt some of the economic and environmental injustices in our energy system as well, if we're thoughtful about it. Um, and siting is critical in that. So, you know, right now we have an energy system that extracts a lot of energy from disadvantaged communities and flows those benefits, economic um, and energy benefits to higher income communities. Um, and it's one that uh, a lot of the most damaging environmental impacts exist in certain communities who are not seeing much benefit from um, those you know, point sources, power plants, whatnot, um, but are seeing all the environmental injustice. So when we're thinking about solar siting, I think there's a lot of critical questions to keep in mind with the next equity lens. One is access. Um, who has access to solar power and the many benefits it provides, cleaner power, uh, you know, bill savings, good jobs, local tax benefits. Um, so who are, uh, you know, do we have systems like community solar that allow folks who don't have land, urban communities to access solar uh, and some of the economic benefits of that? On the flip side, are we finding ways to put solar arrays and the economic benefits from hosting solar um, in disadvantaged communities that haven't had a chance to reap a lot of the economic benefits of our energy system? Um, there are a lot of different angles to get at this. Are we also building solar uh, in certain communities and then flowing a lot of the benefits to other ones via things like community solar, for instance, is a real equity question. But at the core, the biggest answer is just partnership. We can be sure that we're addressing some of these injustices if we're talking to a broad and diverse set of stakeholders in a really authentic way and empowering folks to have a say in the system. Um, we just put out, uh, my colleague did in Utility Dive, an article about authentic partnerships and the importance to clean energy of building those with uh, disadvantaged communities. But I would just highlight that I think is, is critical. We need to be going to the communities who have been traditionally disadvantaged by our energy system and talking to them about what that has felt like and it impacted their lives, what they see as a positive vision for the future and how we work with them in a way that benefits both um, clean energy industries, conservation advocates and uh, communities on the ground so that we're making smart, more balanced decisions in the future. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yep, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Um, and I will, I will say that, um, uh, you know, we, for me personally, um, you know, sort of checking a lot of assumptions makes, you know, such a big difference. For example, um, you know, of the programs that are available to and geared toward owners of single family houses when, you know, there are the disadvantaged communities are, you know, not even part of that, you know, universe um, that there's, you know, there's just already baked in to, a, a, you know, programs that are that are focused on that, um, that that just automatically excludes um, you know, disadvantaged, some disadvantaged sectors uh, because they haven't had the opportunity to build enough wealth to own a home. Um, so we have about 15 minutes um, or so to, to do some questions. Um, and I, I wanna get a chance for our audience to hear from, from everybody on the panel. Um, so we're gonna do, a, you know, a quick, a quick round robin. Um, and I'm gonna ask, one of the questions that came through is um, it's been asked a few different ways, but I think that we can we can hear from many of our other panelists about um, what what their thoughts are on, you know, kind of what's the most important policy, um, you know, when it comes to uh, siting solar on farmland, you know, how and why, you know, what makes it effective and um, in terms of protecting farm and forests and achieving our climate goals. So I'm gonna start with Lucy, um, if you could um, chime in on that question and then we'll, uh, we'll tap a couple of our other, other folks on the team. Yeah, 
I think, and it's already been really talked about, and I was really happy to see that. Um, and I think maybe some folks will be really disappointed in my answer, but uh, my answer is a working group, um, a state-led working group. And that's so important. It's something that we've lacked in Massachusetts. Um, we're really pushing forward in New York. Maine has had a number of working groups, but they're not state-led, but um, they've managed to be effective on municipal education and public outreach. Um, and just starting to broach the subject on siting as well. Um, but I just, the working group can solve a lot of the issues that we have um, in terms of missing each other, <laughs> solar and conservation um, and environmental NGOs. Um, we often are really siloed in our uh, policy conversations. You know, we spend a lot of time with our good friend, Sean Guerin, because he is often the convener of those types of groups. Um, and we do make progress, but we find that there's miscommunication because the state isn't formally involved in them. And I know that the state has their hands full with a lot of uh, land use policy and all that kind of stuff, but I really do think that if, um, particularly in Massachusetts, if we had an agri uh, agricultural dual use working group, but also probably a larger siting um, commission, which I believe that there's some legislation at the state house currently um, with the climate bill that could make that happen. I really do think it can um, make the process more straightforward and everybody will get on the same page about what a sustainable solar siting future looks like. So that's my answer. I know people will probably going to look for me to say something a little more specific, but I really do think we need to start there. Okay. Um, Phelps, could um, you give your perspective on um, whether you think these kind of approaches are, um, you know, going to help us reach our goals? Sure. And it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I, I think, um, as, as we've heard from you, Deborah and, and Genevieve, um, there's a there's a clear tension here, which is informing um, this entire webinar series, in which we're seeing play out with the citing of other renewable resources, um, but I, I think um, if solar siting is designed well, we we can achieve our, our climate and conservation goals simultaneously. Um, it's going it's going to be challenging, as we've already heard and as we will hear. Um, but I think there, there's two there's two layers here. Um, attention exists at two levels. One, there's no doubt that um, climate change change is an existential threat. Uh, we're running out of time to act, and we need solar energy. To help us achieve our goals, um, but it's also critical that we, we protect our um, our farms and forests, not not just as economic as, assets, but as cultural treasures and, and environmental resources. And I think we really to build on what Sean was saying and and um, what Lucy said. I, I think it's really important, and, and and CLF is doing this internally, but also in our coalitions that we work with, trying to expand the the table of stakeholders, engaging as as early and as often as possible. Um, so that we can hear about the the, the, um, the varying interests here, and, and and making sure that we take take the time to hear from folks, but also that we that we address this immediate threat. And I just want to point out one, one thing that um, Genevieve flagged in in her remarks is um, I think one option for trying to strike this balance between uh, climate and conservation, which is agro agrovoltaics or or uh, dual use solar. Um, and I, I think because it's, it's, it allows us to, to use this one piece of land to do two things, uh, namely ge generate solar energy and, and also continue farming, I think that's, that's one way um, that we can think about achieving uh, our climate and conservation goals. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, so a follow-up question to Emily. Um, you know, policies um, and incentives like, um, you know, dual use solar, um, you know, they have they have some benefits and then they have some risks, right? I mean, there's, you know, the impacts potentially on the agricultural production or also on the, the solar production, um, you know, that would, would otherwise not, you know, be faced by either <laughs> a farm or a, or a solar development. Um, so how, how do we, how do we address um, the value of going that route when it might impose additional costs? Uh, thanks, Deborah. Um, 
you know, when, when we look at agricultural production, it will absolutely be affected, it'll be impacted, there'll have to be adjustments, um, and, and perhaps you'll get 75, 80%, you know, of what you could have produced before, um, depending on obviously the crop and the type of production. Uh, and for solar, it's true, if you're thinking about acre by acre, you are spreading the panels apart, you're spreading the rows apart, you're trying to make sure that there's um, still enough sunlight going in and around um, the panels and the rows to produce um, un underneath it and around it. So that also is going to lower the number of panels and lower the production per acre. Um, you know, if you look at them both uh, sort of in a vacuum, yes, you know, we are basically siting solar, we're going to lose production of agriculture and we're going to spread out solar um, and have less solar production. But if you think about them, these are two activities that are being depressed, say from 100% to 75%, but they're happening on the same acre, whereas otherwise you have only 100% solar or only 100% ag. And so together you're actually really improving uh, the land use efficiency land use efficiency. So you're getting 150% of total production on the same land. You know, and there are added costs, but that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the ability to have production to, to continue to meet some, you know, New England food vision needs and to continue to meet climate needs. And, and that doesn't even take into account all of the added climate benefits, these co-benefits that can be addressed once you have farmers who have more of a steady income. And once we have the ability to actually turn to the practices on site, um, you know, personally, as a soil scientist and in, in the farmland protection sphere, I see this as an opportunity um, to really get to, to maximize the types of, of best practices on these lands with that added security for farmers. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm scrolling through um, some of the awesome questions that our participants have um, sent and and I just want to say for for some of them there um, we're we're going to we're going to hand them off to the panelists on some of our future uh, webinars um, in the interest of time since you know we're we're getting down to it here um, but I wanted to um, give uh, Lucy another chance to um, share her thoughts um, and. This one is about just the role of solar companies and their um, kind of criteria, their priorities and their decision making um, and, you know, how that drives, um, it, you know, engagement with site selection. Um, you know, how much does the, the bottom line um, affect the decision? Um, and what other, um, what other, can, you know, what other criteria um, are, you know, companies like Blue Wave Solar taking um, taking up as, as they seek out sites? Yeah, thanks for this question, um, because I think there are a number of misconceptions about how solar companies operate and what our financial models look like. Um, our margins are shockingly not our number one concern. Um, our number one concern and the number one thing uh, variable that impacts our models is interconnection costs. Often it's in the millions of dollars um, and the upgrades to the grid that we have to do in order for a particular project to move forward um, is the number one cost barrier. Um, and that really is a huge trigger in why we choose certain sites. Um, you know, we, you know, and also the feeders, if they're, you know, totally stacked or slammed or anything like that, that is a, a major um, consideration of ours when we look into siting. You know, it's not just flat farmland or, you know, obviously that's a part of our, our little do as well, but um, we're always looking to make sure that our interconnection costs don't kill our projects. Um, and there's, but also sometimes those are needed in those um, rural areas and can really bring additional economic development benefits to the community. For example, um, upgrading to three-phase power. So that means that not only is there going to be a community solar project on that farm, but that farm may then stop using their diesel-powered water pump, you know, and because now they've upgraded to three-phase power. So there's a number of things that we uh, developers take into consideration when siting. Um, it's not always just squeezing the margins out. Um, I think. And that's why I'm going to circle it back to a working group. 
I think it would be really important for each of the states to have a, a state-led working group because so that, you know, conservation and environmental NGOs can hear from us ourselves um, what we do consider when looking at siting. Um, and I think that they'll find it's very interesting. We've already had a number of conversations with um, some NGOs explaining that because we could do a better job explaining that. Um, I also do want to point out that um, the, I call it kind of third wave solar in Massachusetts. Um, we rode the first and second waves uh, because everybody wanted solar and we didn't do a good job as an industry communicating the benefits and what our financial models look like and why we cite on things. Um, so this is an important part of the conversation that we're having now and why I'm here today um, and why I work with Sean and why I work with Emily and a number of others, um, as, as well as a few of our uh, industry colleagues as well, just trying to get the information out there to dispel some of the misconceptions of um, particularly round siting. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so a question um, for Genevieve to start, and then we could probably open it up to, um, to everybody else on, on, our, on our team and our panel here. Um, so a, a lot of our participants are bringing up concerns about um, you know, it, NIMBYism um, and how um, those types of, you know, in the context particularly of um, you know, conservation and um, and preserving agriculture that that is, you know, it, is that, you know, sort of a, a black and white either or um, type of choice? Um, and, you know, are we making it, you know, how do we make it easier for solar development or how do we make it, how do we make it harder development in the context of, you know, kind of a, a, a NIMBY um, type of, of uh, framework? And, you know, particularly how do we address the kind of community engagement that Lucy was just talking about with um, the kind of costs and the community decision making that we need. So I don't Genevieve, if you could, um, you could start with that one. So I, I think that's a, a huge question in some ways, right? But um, so I, I have to say, I don't really like the word nimbyism. I think that, it, and I ask my students at, at times not to use it and to consider the um, real interests that may be behind someone who is trying to participate in a hearing or bring up concerns about, you know, an, any development project. Um, it, I remember being at a hearing at the Vermont Public Utility Commission, and one of the issues was tenant farmers that were being sort of kicked off of the land um, in so that solar development could go on the land instead. And there was a lot of discussion about those interests as sort of nimbyism when I was feeling like, wait a minute, this is these were legitimate agricultural uses that were occurring on the land and, and these tenant farmers don't have any control over what is happening with the parcel of land that they were using for a livelihood. Um, because the landowner has decided to sell it for a more, you know, to, to put it to a more sort of economic purpose. That being said, I think um, there are just complainers or people that don't, you know, sort of don't want to see uh, solar development. I, 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 ha I also have a problem with sort of overly strict aesthetic rules. I think when you, you know, I'm from West Virginia originally, and if you look at a coal plant versus a solar array, you know, let's have a conversation about aesthetics and privilege and all kinds of things. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, uh, NIMBYism is solved best through stakeholder engagement, as we were saying, and really community outreach and communication um, that helps to get everyone on this, you know, get people on the same page about any development in a community, not just solar development. Thank you. I wish we had more time um, because there are some really great questions out there. And I know that, you know, Sean and Phelps and Lucy and Emily and, and I would love to also share our thoughts on, on this particular issue. But we will take these um, topics forward to our future discussions and our future presentations and including the questions that we didn't get to today. So again, I wanna thank everybody um, for being part of the polls, um, for, um, for contributing these really great questions. Um, and 
So I, oh, I just got the, um, <laughs> I just got the go ahead to take a couple more minutes. Um, so why don't I open this back up and see whether um, anybody else on the panel would like to um, to supplement what um, Genevieve has shared. I'll add quickly and then uh, someone else can jump in before we have to wrap this up that um, the point that Genevieve brought up about tenant farmers uh, is a significant and often, often I think overlooked issue. So many farmers are depending on um, rented farmland and you cannot compete um, with a acreage payment that's sometimes 10 times what you um, you know, are facing, you're paying a farmer $100 an acre and, and they're, you know, they're looking at much more lucrative, lucrative contracts. Um, and that is a real threat to our local food economy. Um, and sometimes often uh, not thought about or, or perhaps just not given enough attention. I agree, I wanted and to... I, I, I do, if I could quickly say, I think this pressure isn't simply just coming from the need to develop solar, but from many other kinds of development as well. And I, that is something that is important for us to, to you know, kind of make a distinction um, uh, and to, you know, and to keep in, in the back of our minds, right? Okay, sorry, Lucy, didn't mean to cut you off, but you were gonna- No, that's a really important point, Deb, and I appreciate it too. Um, but one of the, the things that the solar industry can do um, and that can, that we can help provide the solution for and work, and that includes working with the state to uh, work through the dual use process too, in Massachusetts in particular. Um, but dual use is really important for succession planning for farmers. And um, one of the things that we're really excited about at Blue Wave is that we're working with the Aggies and um, UMass and trying to connect um, new farmers with opportunities and creating new farmland in Massachusetts through dual use. And um, tying it back very to the beginning about the equity question, this is a really important tool that the industry should and can use um, to put farmland back into BIPOC farmers' hands, and uh, that's Black, Indigenous, people of color. And that is a major equity issue, and we think that the solar industry can play a big part of that. Um, and the, you know, transfer of land from uh, to younger farmers, um, but in particular BIPOC farmers. Um, just wanted to put that point out there too. Yeah, that is really exciting to think about that that opportunity there. Phelps or Sean, um, in the last um, few seconds that we have here. I'll just say briefly, I think we need an empowerment of proactive and positive movements from local communities around siting and land decisions. And I don't just mean, um, you know, putting in clean energy, but also protecting local farms and, and conservation lands. And the fact of the matter is that farmland is being used for solar because farming is a really tough and oftentimes borderline or uneconomical business in the Northeast. And solar can help families to survive, to keep their land or to, to see a profits and their kids to college, whatever it is. We need proactive um, opportunities for farmers to continue to farm. We need to find ways to support local agriculture and same thing on land conservation. And on the flip side, I think we all, or at least most New Englanders, understand the urgency of the climate crisis. And we really need a lot of solar in addition to offshore wind and storage and a lot of the other options on the table. We're going to need all of it and we're going to need a lot of it. So we need local communities to really be pushing for more solar in the places where they do want to see it uh, and fighting like heck to make that happen. And I think that sort of uh, yes in my backyard is a more <laughs> support for um, the right types of, of land use are critical from, from local communities and it's on all of us to help support that. And I'll just, I'll just add, I think, uh, we just need to increase access, access to technical expertise, um, access to deliberative and decision-making processes, you know, so they're not happening in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week and, and things like that. But, Absolutely. Just, uh, uh, or go ahead, Emily. Go ahead, uh, go ahead Lucy. Yeah, last second, then we'll do the wrap up. Go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna give kudos to Maine um, for providing those opportunities for access to ex expertise. Um, we've participated on a number of panels um, with other developers as well, um, directly with 
the uh, main municipal association and the council of governments up there too um, in each planning region uh, it's just that they'd asked it they asked for us to do that they wanted to get up to speed and it was the the easiest and quickest way was uh, to get access to you know your typical um, usual developer and the, learning the process. Uh, so I really do encourage um, other organizations similar to that um, to put together access to expertise. I, thanks for that, Phelps, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Lucy. Um, thanks to everybody. We are we are almost on time, just one minute over. We had to get some more questions in because they're so great. I really appreciate all of our, our uh, attendees today. Thank you, Lucy, for joining us. Thank you to all of our partners here on this project. Um, and many folks are asking if this is recorded. It is, and it will be emailed to everyone who registered, and it will be made available on the resource pages on the Farmland Information page and this project page on farmland.org. Um, so uh, please share it wide, and please come back and uh, visit us next week when Phelps and Deb will, will take a deeper dive into balancing land conservation. Um, right, which is really one of the, the the central pivotal points here that we need to work on. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week, and we hope to see you all here next week. Um, and one last thank you to uh, John Merck Fund, the Barr Foundation, and National Agricultural Libraries. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.